Good afternoon, church, church family. Good to be here again to worship God in spirit and in truth. But before we do, I'd like to share a passage from 2 Corinthians by way of starting us off before I share the verses. And it reads as follows. <clears throat> this is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I happened upon this during the week and I thought I'd share this with you all because I think it's very meaningful and it really reminds us as to why when why God allows us to go through suffering if we are going through suffering or any tribulation or trials. Listen to the following. Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So what I found interesting is in verse four, Paul says something that I didn't really catch the first time I read this, which is he comforts us in our tribulation, singular, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. In other words, the sense that I'm getting from Paul is that as we go through hardships, as we go through trials or tribulations of any sort, it appears to me what Paul is saying is that as he comforts us with that one particular area in our life, we then can in turn comfort someone else who are going through any trouble, any problem. So we have this sense that we're supposed to take care of each other. So we're to look around and see, is there something I can do to help my fellow brother or sister in Christ? Because when God comforts us, he doesn't want us to keep it to ourselves. It's designed so that we can offer comfort to someone else who is in need. So, and as, as I was reflecting on this, you know, when you look at the life of Christ, he was a problem solver. When people were hungry, he solved it. He gave them bread and fish. Even though there was hardly anything there, he was able to multiply it. When they were sick, he was able to heal them. When they were deaf, when they were blind, he was able to heal them. And so you can see that he was always looking out for people. And as such, I think that as we, as believers in Christ, we now have this fantastic opportunity to not only be comforted by God as we are sensitive to him, we can then in turn comfort the person next to us or someone right across from us and say, how are you doing? You know, giving them the comfort that we ourselves have been given from God himself. That's again, 2 Corinthians chapter one, that was verses three and four. And uh, when, you, when you look at uh, verse six, he says, now if we are afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation, meaning deliverance, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings with which we also suffer. Another way of saying it, in simple words, is that even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. So suffering is a very real part of the Christian life. And so we can't escape it. We're living in a broken world, as you all know. And so right now, with this, as you can see on the monitor, I've been spending time developing this phase two discipleship series, which is part of the basic series, really, that I started earlier this year. And the whole idea is that in phase two, we're learning how to operate under the influence of God, the Holy Spirit. So before I move through the rest of this, let me share some verses and then we'll 
start us off with confession of sin. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Let's pause for a moment of silence so that we can use the rebound technique, which is just 1 John 1, 9. The scripture says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We do this to uh, restore the fellowship that was lost as a result of sin, be it mental, overt, or verbal. Any of those sins will move you away from God. MOV, mental, overt, or verbal. And so although you don't lose God, you don't lose your salvation, the fellowship has been breached. And so the way to recover is through using 1 John 1, 9, which is something that was provided to us ultimately to the person of Jesus Christ. And so we need his help. And as such, we need to make sure we're not grieving or quenching the spirit of God. So let's Pause from, for a moment of silence and name any sins to God if we have any in the privacy of our hearts, and then I'll open with prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to assemble together and to study your word. We are from various places and locations. We have people online, we have people in person in California and uh, in up north, Northern California and the like. And so as we move through this series, our aim, Father, is to ultimately please you and honor you with our life. And so as we move through this particular study, I'm hoping and I'm confident that it will renovate who we are as an individual so long as we exercise our volition and are willing to apply these principles and these verses to life. And so as we move through this, I pray, Lord, that we would be all convicted, that we would be motivated to apply, apply these truths to life so that these would not just be academic knowledge, but it will transfer from gnosis to epinosis where we can utilize it under the filling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, who will empower us and equip us and illuminate the truths when we need truth to be discerned. And we ask and pray all of these things through Christ's matchless name in which we pray. Amen. Okay, so you'll recall, and I'll try, I, I don't have a lot of slides today. Um well, I say that, but uh, let, let, let's just see how far we get. So let me just advance this and you'll recognize some of these here. You all know this slide that we've been using for about two years now, longer if you've been with me for the past decade. I've always broken down the salvation uh, package, one, two, and three, because that's very typical of what you learn from a good seminary or Bible school. You always learn that salvation has three tenses, and I'll not go here, but what I do want to focus in on is right in the middle. That's our focal point, because right now we're living, we're alive, we're, we're struggling, we wrestle with sin, we have the sin nature embedded in our DNA, so the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, and so we need to figure out how we can handle the sin nature, we can't do it on our own strength. It has to be through the help with the assistance of God, the Holy Spirit. And that's what I've been studying and preparing. And so as we move through this, I'm hoping that you see these kernel of truths that I'm seeing for the first or maybe second time so that we can apply it to life, okay? The goal is to live in victory, no longer under the influence of God, um, I'm sorry, under the influence of the sin nature. So the more that we're in tune with God, the Holy Spirit, and his leading and his empowerment, we should be able 
to over time see a decrease in the sins of the flesh, the works of the flesh, in other words. And we're going to see in just a moment the difference between the works of the flesh and living after the flesh. There's a difference between the two. But for starters, you'll recall. Let me see if I can. <clears throat> This is uh, another thing that we I was looking at here. Romans 5, remember, this is the verse right in the middle in phase two of the diagram and on the bottom under disciple. And it reads as such, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So please look in the front here or on the screen for it. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So please notice in yellow, having now been justified by his blood, the words we shall be saved is what's called the future passive indicative of the verb sozo, saved. So it's future tense, passive voice. So this is something that will occur in the future. Being that it's passive voice, that tells us and lets us know that it's something that will happen to us. What will happen to us? We shall be saved. What's another word for saved? Delivered. Delivered from what? From the wrath through him. So indicative mood means it's just a statement of fact. And so this is something that's forthcoming as we find out how we can be saved from the wrath through him. So please notice something here. I, meant, I may have mentioned this before, but just in case I didn't, I'll say it again. This is the only passage in all of scripture where you have phase one and phase two in one passage. There's no other passage that shows justification and sanctification in one passage. So if you look here, having now been justified, that means we've been declared righteous by his blood. And the word blood there uh, points us to the death of Christ on the cross. And so he was the propitiation. He was the satisfaction. He satisfied the justice of God. And so we were been justified by his death on the cross. What did he say on the cross? It is finished. So we have been declared righteous by his blood. So we've been saved. We shall be saved from wrath through him. So you see two salvations here. We've been saved by his blood, justified, and we shall be saved. That's future tense. We shall be saved from wrath through him. So that's still in the future. That How many times can you get saved in the future? Multiple times. And that's what I've been honing in on and trying to develop this whole idea of being delivered or saved from the power of sin. And so there's some terms here that I find interesting, and we'll move along now and see what else we can see together. So you'll recall that in Romans 1.16, I pointed out, remember Romans 5, we just read that, uh, same author, same book, but in the opening of chapter 1, what did Paul say? Paul said, I'm not ashamed, or another word for ashamed is embarrassed, right? I'm not embarrassed of the gospel of Christ, the euangelion of Christ. That's the word for gospel, which means the good news. I'm not ashamed of the good news of Christ. Why? It is the power of God to what? To salvation. So what's that mean? You'll recall two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I had taken us through Romans 1, and it was loaded with information about how people suppress the truth and they are without excuse because God made it known it was innate in each person. Every person knows God is real. They just suppress the truth long enough to, to the point where they believe there is no God. So, but Paul argues from the very beginning, Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed Think that through. Let that sit for a little more, for a moment. I'm not embarrassed of the gospel of Christ. Can you identify with Paul? Are you like Paul? 
you're not embarrassed of the gospel of Christ? Are you making a stand for Christ? I'm not saying that you have to go out and knock on doors, but li listen to what he says. He says, I'm not embarrassed. Why? Because it's the power of God to salvation. What is the power of God? The gospel or the good news of Christ. And as you'll recall, I took us through, and from 18 to 32, there's a whole slew of sins that people were wrestling with. And these were believers. Of course, the unbelievers wrestled with the sin too. Homosexuality, lesbianism, and the list goes on and on and on. And so Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to deliver me from haters of God, fornication, adultery, lying. And so all those sins Paul lists in 18 to 32 is all it flows after 16, which I find interesting because Paul's saying, in essence, look, I'm not embarrassed of the gospel. Could it be the reason why you are struggling with those sins is because you're ashamed of the gospel? So Paul sets this up so that we would be, we would not miss this. I'm not embarrassed because there's power in the gospel of Christ. And then from 18 down to 28 to 32, there's a whole slew of sins that the, the church at Rome was struggling with. And Paul starts, the, he opens it up and he says, well, I'm not ashamed for it's the power of God to salvation. So could it be the reason why you guys are struggling is because you're embarrassed? That seems to be the sense of what Paul is saying here. So I, I'm, I, I'm spending time on this one verse and reiterating over and over and over because I want you to see that there is inherent power in the gospel. If there's anything I want you to see in this one verse, there's power in it, okay? And it's linked to salvation. And I'm not talking about being born again, believing in Christ. That's, that's already a done deal. He's writing to the believers. If you look at Romans 1, he's talking to the saints of Rome, the believers. So apparently, there were believers who were struggling with the sins that we're struggling with today. But his solution was, I'm not embarrassed, I'm not ashamed of the good news of Christ, because in it is the power of God to deliverance. Notice how I inserted the word deliverance. I didn't say salvation because it's the same thing. Salvation means sozo or soteria, the noun of sozo, is the same word for saved, which basically means delivered. So if, depending on the context if I say um, I was standing at the street and Don pushed me out of the way and I say he saved me, the context there is he saved me from being run over. So, but if I say, you know, we were sitting together, we were having coffee and, you know, Don shared the gospel with me and I believe in Jesus Christ for the very first time, I'm saved. So now we can see in our minds, we're talking about justification. I've accepted Christ. I believed in Christ for, for my salvation. I now have everlasting life. So that's in our mind. Once we, we pair it up with the context, we now know that I believed in Christ for the very first time. I'm now saved, justification or phase one. But if I, if I was pushed out of the way, my life was saved literally, physically from being hit by a car. So that's also true. But save there is a different save. So I, I say that because Paul is saying, I'm not embarrassed for the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God to deliverance. Deliverance from what? Well, he goes and argues that people who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, they suffer with these things. And remember, there were three unfolding. God abandons them and turns them over to themselves the wrath of God revealed, it is revealed right now. And yes, believers can suffer from this too, which is why Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed because in it, there's power. So moving forward, <clears throat> I just wanted you to see that there's power in the gospel and something also we need to be clear on. Look at Romans 8.8. 8. What is Paul saying here? 
those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Have you ever been in the flesh? Do you ever act out in the flesh? What's the difference? Are you ever operating under the flesh? Paul says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But this is very, very particular. And while I was still there in California, how many times have you heard me emphasize this word here, the preposition in? You remember that? In. So are we in the flesh today? The answer is no, you're in Christ. Are you not? So that's important to know. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So what is Paul talking about here in Romans 8, 8? Those who are in the flesh, those who are unregenerate, those who have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ as of yet, they are still in who? They're in the flesh, but who are they in? If Jesus Christ is the second Adam, who are they in? Who are the people in who are called in the, who are said to be in the flesh? They're in Adam. Remember the first Adam? So they're positionally in Adam, and those who are in Adam or in the flesh cannot what? Cannot please God. So from the very get-go, it's very important for us to be clear on this. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, what about acting out in the flesh? Is, is that possible? Yes, there, it is possible, but that's different. If you look at Romans 8, 5, those who live according to the flesh, that's different from Romans 8, 8. Those who live according to the flesh, they have a mindset on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. So the two are different. The top verse, Romans 8, 8, refers to the person who is unregenerate. They're not born again. They're still in the flesh or positionally in who? In Adam. We're trying to get people in the second Adam. How do they get into the second Adam, leaving the first Adam? By placing their faith in Jesus Christ. Well, how about when we act out in the, in, in the flesh, when we sin, isn't that living in the flesh? No, that's, isn't that being in the flesh? No, that's living according to the flesh. That's different. That's why I laid out the verses here. So you can see that there's something called in the flesh, that's positional truth. That's a very unique term for those who are unregenerate in the flesh. Think of in Adam, in the flesh, in Adam, unregenerate, not born again. In the flesh, they cannot ever, ever please God. Even if they give a million dollars to church, that would never impress God. Why? Because he's provided a solution for the sin issue through the person of his Christ, uh, to the, through the person of his, his son, Jesus Christ, who said, it is finished, to tell us die. So there's no other work that needs to be done aside from believing in him. That's it. It's a, it's a gift. It's a gift that comes through faith alone and Jesus Christ alone. So those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Are you ever in the flesh? No. You are all believers in Christ. You could never, ever be in the flesh. That's like saying, you can, can you undo your regeneration? Can you undo your spiritual birth? No, you can't. Can you act out in the flesh? Yes, that's the next verse. Those who live according to the flesh, which is uniquely different and distinct from being in the flesh. Being in the flesh is your position. Living according to the flesh is a mindset. You see the difference? Mindset. Living according to the flesh, you're acting like an unbeliever. Okay? This is important to be clear on because we're advancing through phase two and these truths need to be dialed in in order for us to be able to go beyond this now i want us to see the difference between uh, examples of the work of the flesh and then living according to the flesh there is a passage in scripture which we've seen in the past where there were believers living according to the flesh okay they were they were believers they were regenerate they were born again so first, the works of the flesh found in Galatians 5. 
The works of the flesh are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Anything that's similar to these things in this category falls under the works of the flesh. Okay. So that's an example of the works of the flesh. Now, in 1 Corinthians, you'll recall Paul speaking to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Here, 1 and 2. I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal. It's that word sarkikos, fleshly. As to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you are not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able. So this, there's been about a five-year gap when Paul, the Apostle Paul last spoke to this church. Five years, in, it appears that five years for Paul was enough time for them to be fed with solid food, but until now, they're still waddling in diapers. They're still infants. He says, but notice two things here. I could not speak to you as mature people. I could not speak to you as mature Christians, believers in Christ. So not only could he not speak to them as mature people, but he had to feed them milk, not solid food. So the teaching had to be with the basics again. That's why the, the words milk signify that it's very elementary, you know, how to be saved. And if you look at chapter two, he, he argues that I know nothing but Christ crucified. So very basic. So you see that he had to go back and adjust his teaching because they were not spiritually ready. He says, and even now you're still not able to. And then when we proceed to the next verse, for you are still carnal, that word is fleshly, for where there's envy, strife, and divisions among you all, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Here's that, see the words mere men in green right there in verse three? Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? What's that referring to? Aren't you, aren't you acting like an unbeliever? How many times have we looked at someone and said, oh, they're not really saved? Or we've heard people say, that guy's not saved because he does A, B, C, D. We could never and we should never judge based on the external because you can't tell what has transpired inwardly. You don't know if the person has placed their faith in Jesus Christ or not. So to judge them from the external is, um, it's not fair. It's not accurate assessment of the spiritual condition of the individual. We all have bad days. Look at the prodigal son in Luke. So I'm not in any way encouraging living a lifestyle of the prodigal, but the truth is we cannot ascertain based on the visual whether or not a person is saved or not because only God sees the heart. That's not our job anyways. We just have to take them at their word. If they're a believer in Jesus Christ, if they place their faith in Jesus Christ, then maybe they're just having a bad day. And so look at here, Paul is saying to this entire church, you're still carnal. I can't even teach you. I can't even give you solid food. I have to give you milk. Where there's envy, strife, and divisions, these kind of uh, behaviors within the church cause Paul to back off and say, I can't give you solid food. You're not ready for it. I want to give you deeper um, doctrines, but you're not ready for it. You are still carnal. In fact, I heard that there's envy, strife, and divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like those outside of the church, mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not being carnal? So you can see that these things are grounds for not being able to understand the solid food of God's word. And so... This is from Paul talking to the church. And so now we have this. 
So you're saying, okay, Pastor Freddie, okay, I get it. So we, we can, you have the works of the flesh and we have living according to the flesh. So how does that help me? Well, how that helps you is to follow me and follow this study because look what happens here. And we've looked at this briefly, but I'm going to attach several more slides and more. I'm going to expand on it just a little bit more um, on the abiding aspect and how we can experience his power. But please notice here in Romans 8, 11, right in front of you. For if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So I know we've touched on this even last week. Again, I'm, I'm adding this back here because I'm, I'm building on uh, truth, precept upon precept, truth upon truth. And so what we see here, if you look right in front, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the what? from the dead. That's called the resurrection of Christ, right? We're about to celebrate uh, Resurrection Sunday soon. So his conquering of death, the spirit who raised Jesus, who dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead, going back to the spirit of him who raised Jesus, will also give life to your mortal bodies. So the idea there is that he will empower our mortal bodies. So the spirit empowers the body in all of its weakness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, the believer can begin to experience the resurrection life or the empowered kind of life right now. So as we move to this, I'm showing you there's multiple passages that seem to be saying the same thing. There is a power that's available to you and to me that's not available to the unregenerate to those who are still in Adam, in the flesh. So the spirit who raised Jesus, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life or give power to your mortal bodies. You have backache, knee ache, leg pains, headaches, all of that. We will still un unfortunately experience that until we get our glorified bodies, which is, I believe, soon. But in the meantime, the kind of power that he gives when you look at Romans and you go back to the previous chapter, Romans 7, what did Paul say? The things I don't want to do, that's what I'm doing. And the things I want to do, I don't do. So the internal struggle, that raging war going on on the inside, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's able to, he finally identified that there is a way to overcome this. And so we're, we're looking at what he says, as well as Jesus and John, what we'll see in a moment. So let's look back at Jesus and re-examine something we looked at about two weeks ago. Look closely. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do what? You can do nothing. So please notice that salvation is always intact. You'll never lose it. There's a lot of reform theologians out there that teach that if you're not abiding, then you're not really saved. Or you prove that you've, you've lost it or you were never really saved to begin with. So they take passages like this and they link it up with the fire that we looked at a few weeks ago, where it was really talking about um, the disciplinary action of God. So it's more of a temporal judgment. It's not the hell or the lake of fire judgment. But they, they jerked that way out of context. And I had pointed out real easily that it was a metaphor. Since Jesus is called the vine and we're called the branches, or his disciples are called branches, that's not literal. And since those are not literal, we don't take the fire as literal either. So it's a horticulture metaphor that Jesus was using to describe to his disciples the communion and, and union that needs to take place between the disciples and Jesus Christ in order to be productive. The issue is production. So notice what he says here. I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. 
So please notice, abiding is not automatic. He who abides in me, not everyone will abide. It's not automatic. So that means it requires your volition. You have to make a conscious decision to say, I will abide in him. And what does it mean to abide? Good question. So we know it comes from the Greek word meno, which means to remain or stay, but there's more to it. And we'll just see in just a moment. So um, abiding is not automatic, but what is in this verse? Can you see what's automatic in this verse? You might not see it unless you look in closely. What is automatic is the much fruit if one abides. That's automatic. Please notice. He who abides in me and I in him bears what? Much fruit. That's what's automatic. Abiding isn't automatic. What is automatic is the fruit, the much fruit, if one abides. So it is imperative. It is critical. It is vital for us to know what it means to abide. What does it mean to abide? Practically speaking, if I'm a new believer in Christ, how would you explain that to me? What does it mean to abide? Okay, so that's, I want you to keep that question in the back of your head. I think we need first John's help in this juncture here. So I'm going to advance it and show you. The question is, what does it mean to abide? Because he who abides in me bears much fruit. That's what's automatic is the much fruit. So what does it mean to abide? Well, let's look at what 1 John has to say. What does John say in 1 John? Look closely. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So please notice, it's the person who keeps his commandments who's abiding in him. That's what it means to abide. It's to keep his commandments. And in addition, he abides in the obedient believer. So the fellowship is vibrant when the believer is abiding. And how does he abide? What does it mean to abide? It's the one who keeps his commandments, abides in him and he in him. So what happens when we're keeping his commandments and we're abiding in him? We bear much fruit, according to John what Jesus taught to his disciples in John 15. You see the connection now? So as we abide, which means keep his commandments, which means it's all about works, then we will bear much fruit. So the obedient believer has God making his home within him. Notice, he keeps his commandments, abides in him, and he in him, meaning Christ in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us. Uh, now it's us. Who's us? The Father and Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that in just a moment. Uh, from Taken from John 14, which is really the ultimate example of um, fellowship. So please notice, now he who keeps his commandments abides in him. So as we keep his commandments, we are considered abiding in him. And when we abide in him, we will bear much fruit. So now... I want to read something from James 4.17. James 4.17, since we're talking about commandments, and see how we fare. James 4.17, if you want to look it up. But I'll read it for the sake of the recording and for you all. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Did you hear that? Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. That's called the sin of omission. You know you ought to do something good, but you don't. That's the sin of omission. The sin of commission is when you commit a sin, intentional or unintentional, and you do it, and it, it's a mental, overt, or verbal sin and you do it willingly, that's a direct violation to God's word, God's mandate. So you have the sin of omission, the sin of commission. What's my point? Why? What's the big deal? So 
I don't sin of commission, sin of omission. Well, what I'm getting at is if you believe that sin grieves God, the Holy Spirit, and when we grieve God, the Holy Spirit, he no longer empowers you. Well, how often are we sinning now? Whether we're talking about sin of omission or sin of commission, if you know to do good and you don't do it, it's a sin, James 4, 17. How many times do you blow that on a given day? So you know you should say hello to someone. You should text them a hello. How are you doing? I haven't seen you in a while. Are you okay? You know, you don't see someone at church for a while. And you know to do good, but you don't. That's a sin, James 4, 17. So my point is, is that could it be that one of the reasons why we're not experiencing victory in our life is because we're, we're in a big mess. We are violating 1 John 3. We're not abiding in him and we're not productive. That's the reason why we're not seeing any answered prayer or anything going on for us. Could that be the reason? Could it be the reason why we're, we're, we're not having the vitality and the power that we would often talk about? Oh, yeah, I, I believe in God. I trust God and I'm, I'm trusting him for my, my problems. But the truth is we're, we're still inside shaking in our boots. And that's because there's no power. I'm not saying that in a, as a put down, but the truth is, notice what he's saying here. If we connect the dots, if you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. And I'll, I'll show you why and what the consequences, the positive consequences to abiding in him are in a chart form, okay? But I'm wanting you to see that the things that we may have thought we've known in the past, maybe it wasn't so clear after all. So abiding in him relates to keeping the commandments. And that's really works, right? That's doing works. Faith without works is dead. So it's all coming together now. And I think this is going to be helpful when we really think this through and advance in our personal studies and our corporate studies like this as, a, as an assembly. So 1 John 3, 24. Now, I'm going to throw a question out, and I want you to think about this, and I, I can't hear your answer, but think about this question here. Is God's love ever conditioned upon our obedience to him, or does he just love us? Think it through. Let me repeat the question. Is God's love ever conditioned upon our obedience to him, or does he just love us unconditionally, no matter what? Okay, that's the question. So <clears throat> for the answer, I'm going to take us now to the passage where I talk, told you uh, in 1 John about how he abides in us. And we know that he abides in us in this John 14, 23. Notice Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, Jesus speaking, he will keep my word and my father will love him. Uh-oh, I thought God loves us no matter what. You mean to tell me it's only when we keep the word of Christ that he loves us? Look right in front of you. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word right? And my father will love him. So keeping the words of Christ will result in the father loving you. Have you ever seen this before? And we will come to him and make our home with him. That's fellowship. That's deep, rich fellowship with God the father and God the son. So please note that the father's love is conditioned upon our obedience to his word. This is what's called the future active indicative of the Greek verb tereo. That word underlined there, keep, is tereo. And it's the idea of guarding, keep watch. So in other words, if we insert the original words here, he will guard my word. If anyone loves me, he will guard my word. Are you guarding his word? Are you standing watch? Are you keeping watch over his word? Because if you do, then you're demonstrating your love for Jesus Christ. Okay? 
So you're loving Jesus Christ. And when you do, and you're keeping guarding his word, the father will love you. Let me, let me read it. Um, just to be clear, Jesus answered and said to him, speaking to Judas in John 14, not Judas Iscariot. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Whose word? Jesus's word. And my father will love him. So if you keep the words of Christ, and if you love him, it'll be demonstrated by keeping his word, the words of Christ. And when you do, my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. In other words, that's fellowship. The indwelling presence of the Father and the Son taking place right there and then as you love Jesus Christ, which is the byproduct of keeping his word. So if you link all these together, if you know to do good and you don't do it, to him it's sin. So you're violating all these commands, and it's I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm pointing at myself as well, but I'm just saying that if, if we're having difficulty trying to make it in this thing called the spiritual life could it be because we're violating multiple things throughout the scripture without even knowing it so the good news is that as we're moving through this we can make adjustments so what does it take to abide we need to obey obey what his commands so as you're exposed to more doctrine his word you can make adjustments and Live out the commands and show Jesus Christ you love him by keeping his word so that the father and the son will make their home in your life. That's what we need. So notice, <clears throat> in closing, I, we're about done now, believe it or not. I told you it wouldn't take long and I didn't have very many slides. Let me show you the benefits of abiding in Christ. We do have more slides, but I'm not going to take it past this, but I just want to comment on this so that you can see what I've um, put here in chart form so it's easier to follow. So some of the new titles we receive when we're abiding in Christ, we become his disciples. John 15, 8 supports this. We become Jesus's friend. Did you know that? That's John 15, 14. And the internal changes in the life of a believer who's abiding in Christ, meaning obeying the commands, taking in his word, the father and the son now abiding in the believer as you're obeying his commands and guarding his word, the words of Christ, you now glorify God because you're able to thank him for the things that he is now starting to reveal to you. And the movement and the leading of God, the Holy Spirit, as you're in fellowship with him, you then get to bear much fruit in ch chapter 15, verse 5, and glorify God, chapter 15, verse 8, and you have the joy of Christ, John 15, 11. So all of this is just from John 15 alone. So you have the joy of Christ. What does the scripture say? The joy of the Lord is my strength. So do you need strength? The joy of Christ, John 15, 11, as you're abiding in Christ, as you're following through with the commands and mandates in God's word, as you guard the words of Christ in your life by making application to it, you also know the plans of God, John 15, 15. You also, this is not good news, but this is just the result of knowing the plan and the will of God. We are, we are told that we will be hated and persecuted by the world. John 15, 18 and John 15, 20. We're also told that we receive answered prayers as we're abiding, John 15, 7. So hopefully you can see that there are some positive things and I'm, I have some more things I'm going to show, uh, but I'm gonna continue this next week and the week after and the week after because I'm, I'm really going to dial this in and I'm on a quest to find out all the things that we need to do as believers in Christ to harness the, the empowering ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. The same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will give power to our mortal bodies. And what we saw in Romans 8 was that as we 
as we are justified by his blood, we will be uh, saved from wrath through him, his life. And so as we saw before, it's a mindset. If we set our minds on the things of the spirit, life and peace. If we set our minds on the things of the flesh, death, right? Doesn't mean necessarily physical death. It could result in that because if you're living according to the flesh, remember the lifestyle, remember the works of the flesh and living according to the flesh, it's all based on a mindset. Works of the flesh is the byproduct of the sin nature doing what it normally does. But now you and I are no longer slaves to the sin nature. We have been purchased from the slave market of sin through the person of Jesus Christ. We don't have to say yes anymore. We can say yes to Christ, no longer to the sin nature. Is it easier said than done? Sometimes it is. But I believe that as we continue to renovate our minds, trusting in him, bringing and integrating all the doctrines that we're seeing in front of us and, and applying it, allowing God, the Holy Spirit to empower us because he's no longer grieved. We're no longer violating the commands. When we know to do good and we do it, we're in compliance with the word of God, thus filled with the spirit, no longer in violation to his word. We're guarding the word. We're obeying the words of Christ, the Toreo, guarding his word. Now the father and the son takes residence in us. He, again, the idea is, is not that we lose the indwelling ministry of the father and the son, but that the fellowship is rich and vibrant. And that's the ideal time to start making decisions from a position of strength. We're calm. We have answered prayers. We bear much fruit. We're productive. We have peace. And we have life and peace with a mindset set on the things of the spirit. So it's, it's coming together. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited to really move through this so that we can see what else is in store based on the word of God. And this is what it's all about when we talk about what a doctrinal church is all about. It's all about getting into the nitty gritty, not just saying, Jesus loved me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. Everybody knows that, even the cults. But being able to integrate and interlock all these truths and principles so that it'll start to make sense. And we have something we can steward rather than just say, I pray all the time and it doesn't work. Some of these things don't require prayer. Some of these things require your volition, a uh, decision to do something about it. Okay. So that's why we will see more of these truths over the next several weeks, if not longer, as we unpack phase two salvation. So having said that, let's close in a word of prayer and then you guys can, uh, I'll see you next week. So for now, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you as always for giving us this opportunity to examine your word. Phase two salvation is really a broad and rich uh, subject, which requires a lot of time delving into the doctrines and your word especially to be able to see what it is that you have revealed to us i take seriously the words of christ when he was dealing with satan the adversary in matthew chapter 4 where he said man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of god and so father as um as one who proclaims the truth I want everyone to see firsthand what every word says according to your word. And so that we have something to steward, we have something to obey, we have something to commit to. We can make adjustments in our lives so that in the end, we can give you the honor and glory that rightfully belongs to you and to you alone. I pray for everyone there in Elisa Viejo that you continue to uh, protect them from all the things that can harm them, be it COVID, accidents, health issues, and challenges. And I just pray that you keep them strong so that they can continue to make a stand for you wherever they go. And uh, for those online who are joining us today, we're grateful that they can be a part of our ministry as well. We know that this is no accident. You've allowed our paths to cross so that we can uh, continue to grow together in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And so we ask, Lord, that you would now bless our the rest of this time that we have with you. 
and the fellowship that was going to take place after this. And we ask all of these things through Christ's matchless name in which we pray. Amen. God bless you all. And I'll see you next week or during the week if you're going to join us for Bible class. Take care. Bye-bye.